Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lord and Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's case is called The Murder Plot Book Plot. The Oda River is the second longest river in Poland. It runs from the Czech Republic through western Poland, forming part of the border between Poland and Germany. Its waters are known as an excellent place for fishermen to catch perch, pike, and sun bass. In December of 2000, three anglers casting from the shore of Wartswaf saw what they thought was a floating log, but upon closer inspection, it turned out to be a human body. Once officers arrived, the remains were removed from the river. They discovered they had the body of a tall man with long, dark hair and blue eyes. He was wearing only a shirt and underwear, but both of his hands were tied behind his back and a noose was tied around his neck. It looked as though the noose was previously connected to the knot at the man's hands, meaning every time he moved, the noose would pull tighter. Their victim matched the description of a missing businessman named Darius Janiszewski, who owned an advertising firm 60 miles away. Darius's wife had reported him missing a month earlier after he was last seen leaving his advertising firm on November 13th. When a pathologist examined him, they found that Darius's body had knife wounds and showed other signs of abuse, leading them to believe that torture was also involved. It also appeared that he had been starved for days before his death. Although they found the noose, which implied he was strangled, water in his lungs suggested that he was actually alive when he entered the water. Although a direct cause of death could not be agreed on, it was clear that Darius had been murdered. An extensive investigation was started. Divers looked in the river for more evidence, while specialists combed the woods and surrounding area. When investigators looked at Darius's life, they found no apparent enemies or debts, he was well-liked, and his advertising firm was doing good. He and his wife had hit a rough patch in their eight-year marriage, but had reconciled and were now adopting a child. A check of his credit card showed that none had been used after his death, ruling out robbery as a likely motive. Darius was also over six feet tall and 200 pounds, leading investigators to believe that more than one person was likely responsible. The only report of a suspicious event came from Darius's mother, Ursula. She said that early in the morning on the day that he disappeared, a man called the advertising company requesting three large billboards. When she tried to find out more about the order, the man refused to speak to her and insisted that he needed to talk to Darius. Because he was out of the office, she gave the man his cell phone number. Later that day, when Darius arrived, he said that he had talked to the customer and would meet him that afternoon. No name was ever given to his mother, and she didn't recognize his voice. Darius left his business at 4 p.m. that day and left his car behind, which the family said was odd. He usually took his car to meet with clients. The receptionist reported that two men seemed to be trailing him as he left his business, but she didn't get a good description of them. When telephone calls to the business were checked, they found that the mysterious call came from a payphone down the street. Two calls had been made from it, one to the advertising firm and the other to Darius's cell phone. Business associates were questioned, but none turned out to be the caller. Six months after the investigation began, in May of 2001, it had gone nowhere and all leads had been exhausted. Detective Yachik Vroblevsky made the decision to stop the investigation until other leads could be developed. In 2003, Vroblevsky decided to take a fresh look at the case. As he poured over the file once again, he noted that the level of brutality shown to the man must mean the attack was personal. He also still believed that the act had been perpetrated by more than one person. As he continued to read, he realized something he had missed the first time around. Darius's cell phone had never been recovered. On a hunch, he searched for the phone's serial number to see if it had ever turned up, and to his surprise, he found that it had. On an auction site called Allegro, just days after Darius disappeared, his phone was sold by a man who went by the login name of Chris B7, who turned out to be a 30-year-old Polish philosopher named Christian Bala. Bala would prove 
almost impossible to track down as he had moved abroad and liked to travel. However, Wroblewski did find that the man had recently published a book called Amuck. Out of curiosity, he bought a copy, and what he read shocked him. Bala's book possessed strong themes of pornography, assault, and murder. The main character, named Chris, is described as, quote, a bored Polish intellectual who, when not musing about philosophy, is drinking and having sex with women. Chris murders his lover by tying a noose around her neck and stabbing her with a Japanese knife. After the murder, Chris sells the knife on an internet auction site. The way the murder was represented echoed Dariush's murder, and the selling of the knife drew strong comparisons to the selling of the cell phone. In the book, the crime is so well covered up that the killer is never caught. These similarities grabbed at Wroblewski, leaping from the page, and he felt that they just couldn't be ignored. He now had his first solid lead. Christian Bala graduated top of his class in both high school and at the University of Wrocław from 1992 to 1997. He was considered to be one of the brightest philosophy students that they had ever seen. Bala was known to brag about his drunk antics and at one point told friends that he was, quote, capable of anything. I will not live long, but I will live furiously. In 1995, he married a woman named Stanislava, and two years later, the couple welcomed their son, Katzper, into the world. As Bala graduated from university, he entered the PhD program for philosophy. However, his marriage soon began to suffer as he was incapable of remaining faithful or providing for his family. In 1999, he started a cleaning business, only to file for bankruptcy a year later. The couple separated and divorced. Bala began to travel. He also started working on his novel, Amok, and would finish it at the end of 2002. Unfortunately, its themes were not well received and few copies were sold. Most Polish bookstores wouldn't carry it, and other countries wouldn't have it at all. Bala was unfazed and believed that at some point the world would see his book as a great literary work. Detective Roblewski needed to talk to Bala, but worried about scaring the man away. Officers were told not to question his friends or family directly, but to look at finances, distant associates, and anything on the periphery. So far, they only had circumstantial evidence, and it would take more than that to get a conviction. Bala traveled until 2005, supporting himself by publishing travel articles. Later that year, Wroblewski finally got word that he was coming home to Poland. Investigators made their arrest on September 5th, after he re-entered the country. When they questioned him about Dariusz's murder, he claimed he didn't know about it, and he didn't know about the man. When he was questioned about the elements in a muck that seemed to match the murder, Bala stated that he had drawn elements from his own life, but not when it came to the fictional murder. Lastly, they confronted him about the cell phone. How did he get it? At first, Bala said he couldn't remember, but when pressed, he claimed that he had bought it at a pawn shop and resold it online for a profit, something that he did from time to time. Investigators had little luck with Bala, but his room at his parents' house where he was staying proved to be a gold mine. Officers found computer files containing information on Dariush, a pen with his company's logo on it, and a telephone card. When the card was traced, it showed that it had made calls to the advertising firm and Dariush's mother, as well as Bala's friends and family. As investigators hit the 48-hour hold limit on their suspect, they knew he had to be charged or released. They were still unable to charge him with the murder, but they could charge him with selling stolen property in the case of the cell phone. He would serve no jail time, but would have his passport taken away and be forced to stay in the country where investigators could keep looking and keep an eye on their suspect. To everyone's surprise, once Bala left police custody, he filed a formal grievance against the department for kidnapping and torture. He claimed that armed men had kidnapped him, tortured him, starved him, and beat him. He also claimed it was Wroblewski and his detectives who perpetrated the act. A formal police investigation was held and no evidence of wrongdoing was found. 
At his trial in February of 2007, the prosecution showed that from 1999 to 2000, during the time his marriage and business failed, Bala became violent towards friends and especially to Stanislava, whom he claimed was cheating on him with Dariush. Even after they separated, just weeks after Dariush's body was found, he remained possessive and abusive towards his wife. At one point, he screamed at a man who he assumed was interested in his wife, saying he had, quote, already dealt with such a guy and to leave her alone. For her part, Stanislava admitted that she and Dariush were interested in each other while she was separated. But when she found out that he was married, she called everything off. The prosecution claimed that Bala didn't believe her and thought the two were sleeping together. Out of jealousy, he kidnapped, tortured, and killed Dariush. Although the defense proclaimed Bala's innocence, he was found guilty of coordinating the torture and murder of Dariush Yanishevsky. On September 5th, 2007, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Today, Bala still sits in jail, serving his sentence, but keeps himself busy, proclaiming his innocence, and writing his follow-up book. Case Cracked I would like to thank The New Yorker, The Guardian, The New York Times, Time Magazine, Wikipedia, PronounceNames.com, HowToPronounce.com, and of course, Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case. And here she is to discuss it with us now. So Christy, uh, after learning about the details of this case, I got to tell you, I'm stuck on one big thing. Uh, it really seems like, I mean, just thinking about trying to kidnap someone over six feet tall, 200 pounds. Uh, I, I don't really know Bala's stats in terms of how big he is, but just restraining someone, the, the acts that happened around this, it really feels like there might've been someone else. Did you mm -hmm. find any info on that or do you have any thoughts? Well, the police did believe there was someone else. Bala's not talking. They couldn't find anybody. But after reading about this man, there's no way that I believe he carried out this dirty work by himself. I don't think he's physically capable and I don't think that he's inclined to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's weird to me because bringing in an accomplice on something like that on such an emotionally fueled crime Mm -hmm. uh, like, how do you convince that person to do it? How do you convince that person to stay quiet after it's done? Like, there's just, there's a lot of different things that kind of work for and against it in my mind. I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. confused, but it, it seems to me like I'd, I'd be looking for another guy in this. I'm, I'm surprised that they weren't able to kind of route that out. Um, I was too. And, uh, I got a little sense from that last comment. You seem to have some <laughs> strong feelings about Bala. You want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, I don't know if it's me personally, but I think any woman who's had to deal with a narcissist gets to where they can sense them, whether it's a newspaper article or if they're standing across the street. Well, and some people, especially this man, felt that he could intellectualize and argue himself out of any situation. Right, right. And mm -mm. yeah, that's pretty interesting that the claims that he tries to levy against the police department, those details sound a bit familiar. <laughs> yeah. It's really bizarre. Yeah. Like, you know, hey, I know this one story so well. I'm just going to keep using this one story over. I'm going to write a book about it. I'm going to write a complaint to the police about it. Like, yeah, I don't. Mm. Uh, so I did do a little research, of course, uh, before doing this reading. I found out that there is the emergency phone number for Poland, uh, which is actually 997. And I looked into that because I saw a reference you had made about 997. I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the, their emergency number, but it's also the name of an unsolved crime TV show. Can you tell us about how their website relates to this case? Well, when they aired their episode on Bala, they created a section of their website just for his case. And they took snapshots of all the different countries that people were doing page views from. Wow. When the detective went back and started looking at these countries, he couldn't figure out why in the world they'd be interested in this little Polish murder. Yeah. When he looked at Bala's passport, the dates that he was in those countries match the times that the website was looked at. So they really feel like he was just scoping them out. Interesting. Interesting. I have heard of that method before. I've heard from some private investigators, they'll kind of do similar things, set up a website somewhere about a particular case, and then they're just tracking every IP that hits it so they can see uh bizarre occurrences like that different trends yeah. that kind of don't make sense why is this you know we're getting this activity from around the world um really really interesting and mm -hmm. an approach to think about 
Um, when they do find his crispy seven account, mm -hmm. did they notice anything else about that account? I mean, when I read that, uh, there was a knife that was involved. I mean, we know that it seemed like there was that type of, of damage to Darius's body as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering, oh, are they going to find that he also sold the knife and there was other items or anything like that? Was there any connectivity? There was a month before the kidnapping, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. Allegro showed a click on the man, the police manual, accidental suicide and criminal hanging. Bala is the one who looked at this book. Now he didn't purchase it, but just the coincidence is too much. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, uh, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I could see where an investigator would find that information interesting. I don't know if at the court level, if that type of information really comes into play, but certainly at the investigation level in terms of uh, where to keep looking and next It steps. definitely helps paint that picture. Yeah, yeah. Well, Christy, thank you so much for all your hard work on today's episode. I can't do it without you. Really appreciate you. <laughs> and uh, I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters, Larissa Merchink, Kelly Joe, Mark Witt, Hillary Green, Brandy Fry, and Special thanks to Sue Morris. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordnarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, or buy merchandise. Case Cracked is frequently demonetized by YouTube. But we know learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is very important to understand the many unsolved cases that we also cover. And we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. I'll be back with a new unsolved mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Art's channel.